All right. Welcome to the Texas Hip Show. I'm Russell Dowden, the publisher and editor for Texas Hemp Reporter. This is the Texas Hemp Show. Joining me again this week, Jesse Williams from the Texas Cannabis Collective. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for coming in and doing the Texas Hemp Show one more week. How are you? I'm doing pretty good this week. Very, very cool. So the hemp ban has been postponed. Or what, what's the word called again? It's temporary injunction. Temporary injunction. That's right. So we have a temporary injunction on the ruling on smokable hemp. I had to become like this expert with these terms quickly. I'm still, I am still learning all of the terms. And to explain some of these terms a little better is our guest, uh, Chelsea Spencer from RitterSpencer.com and, and uh, Spencer, uh, Ritter Spencer Law. How are you, Chelsea? has uh, a mechanism, a procedural mechanism, whereby once they file the notice of appeal, the injunction is no longer uh, in effect towards them. So we filed an emergency motion seeking the Austin Court of Appeals uh, to order that that injunction remain in effect against the state until the time of trial. Uh, And as of right now, we don't yet have an order on that. So So we've technically lost our injunction because of this, with this appeal, correct? I want to make sure uh, we, we, haven't lost the in, we have not lost the injunction. Uh, the state is arguing that during uh, the pendency of the appeal, the injunction does not apply to them. If the Austin Court of Appeals enters an order extending uh, the temporary injunction to the state up until the time of trial, then that remains in place. Um, it's a it's a procedural. It's not. They are substantively attacking the temporary injunction, uh, but we're not there yet on the merits of the court of appeals. This is a procedural issue as to whether the injunction remains in place during the appeal. So right now, a shop wants to sell smokable hemp. It's a no go, correct? It's a no go while the suspension is in place. Understood. Thank you for that clarification. Chelsea, what what are you're you're defending basically the right for all of the retailers? Is that as way I understand it, correct? Uh, manufacturers, processors, distributors, and retailers, everyone across the state of Texas. I think, from my understanding, when this ruling came down initially from the Travis County District Court, they were saying the retail sale we're putting an injunction. There's no ban on that. But the manufacture part, which was part of House Bill 1325, that stays in effect. No. So the, the statutory portion, yes, this is, a, again, a fairly technical issue. So what the statute did was simply direct the Texas Department of State Health Services, which for our purposes today I'm going to call DISHES. So the statute directs DISHES to adopt a rule banning the manufacturing and processing of smokable hemp. Nothing in the statute provides an enforcement mechanism. It it doesn't simply state it as a matter of law. It simply directs them to adopt the rule. Not only did the dishes adopt the rule on banning processing and manufacturing, they also added retail sale and distribution. So when the court enjoins the enforcement of the rule here, it's enjoining dishes being able to enforce the rule against manufacturing, processing, retail, and distribution. Okay, then let's say I saw the original ruling that was handed down by Judge Livingston, and it was like really simple and compressed. And one of the attorneys involved mentioned to me is like, this is just it's it's almost like it's broad and not informative enough compared to what was released the next day. So that was a that was a letter ruling, and a lot of people were confused about some of the language in there where she said Mm -hmm. denied in part and granted in part. The denied in part went to the fact that uh, part of our petition included a rule, uh, and we included it in the fact session, but it also made it down to the application for temporary injunction that uh, is a TEA specific portion of the statute. That if you attended the hearing, you heard the state argue that she has no power to uh, enjoin TEA here because they're not a party to the lawsuit. That's the portion that was denied. Okay. Chelsea, is this more about? The police being able to arrest people for marijuana still, and are they trying to define this smokable hemp as 
I think it's a confusing it, to me it's a lot of it it's over my head a lot of it but I'm trying to understand it and it seems to me that the the the, the state wants to still be able to prosecute marijuana while it's illegal and they're trying to throw smokable um, smokable hemp into the same uh, basket with marijuana is that what we're really how I'm trying to wrap my head around it Chelsea Absolutely. It, it took a while for us to hear from the state in this case what their asserted governmental interest was. And when we finally heard that uh, around the time of the September 14th hearing, despite the fact that this case has been filed over a month and a half, um, you heard them stand before the court and state that this is because law enforcement cannot distinguish smokable hemp from marijuana. However, when we look at these regulations and the statute here, the government interest is negated by the fact that the legislature did not ban use, consumption, or possession by a citizen. So I can drive an hour over to Louisiana and buy as much smokable hemp as I want, drive back here to Texas to any public place, and smoke it. And there's absolutely nothing the state of Texas can do about that. So if that was truly their compelling or, or rational interest that they've stated here, they've undermined it in that they still allow Texas citizens to freely possess, use, and consume these goods. I noticed that you mentioned a drive. You're talking about driving an hour to like Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, wherever. And a question came up about, to me, when people want to order online, with the order that they had initially put in place, the rules somebody say he could not sell it on Amazon out of Michigan into Texas. Would that be correct? That's what Texas is trying to do. Uh, so, so two, two things there. Amazon doesn't allow the sale of CBD goods. If you see something advertised on Amazon, that's actually a hemp oil extract. They only permit generally recognized as safe hemp goods. So to the listeners, don't, don't buy CBD products or, or hemp products off of Amazon unless you're looking for hemp oil, hemp seed, or another gross ingredient. Um, there is a question about that right now. The rules in the, the black and white letter law of the rule does not state that e-commerce sellers need to register or abide by the rules imposed by dishes. But what we noticed was that when dishes was responding to the public comments in the Texas Register, dishes uh, they were actually answering a, a question of mine that um, they responded that out of state sellers not only need to obtain retail registration but here's here's the important part need to comply with quote unquote this chapter and this chapter meaning the rules so technically it appears that dishes is poised to preclude out of state sellers from selling smokable hemp products into Texas which quite frankly raises issues both under the um, anti-interference with transport clause in the 2018 Farm Bill and uh, federal law with pre preemption issues and in interstate commerce. Uh, however, um, for very strategic purposes, we did not pursue those issues in, in the underlying lawsuit here. When did they rule for the injunction? Till February or January? Uh, I believe our trial date was February 1st, 2021. And if we get an order from the Austin Court of, Court of Appeals reinstating uh, the injunction, and we have high hopes that, that we will, that would remain in place until trial at that date. The uh, state of Texas could take a uh, mandamus up to the Texas Supreme Court and try to fight at the Texas Supreme Court, but I would hope uh, that the state of Texas has better things to do with taxpayer money right now. I wonder, yeah. what would you advise businesses to do right now? Because it's kind of, I go to a shop and they're like, we want to sell, but you realize it's like, well, they were doing this every two weeks beforehand. And if you do every two weeks, by the time somebody orders a product, it gets to the store, the state could have changed its mind. It's like the decisions go with the flag in the wind. So how should businesses really it, handle it is, this? It is quite difficult, but a, a little bit to understand on the procedure here. So in the state of Texas, a restraining order can only last 14 days. So that's how we had to go back. The parties agreed to extend it because the court wasn't available for the full hearing. Now that we've got the temporary injunction, this interlocutory appeal should be the last hurdle to keeping it in place until trial because, again, unfortunately, the Texas rules were amended in 2017, and they put the burden on the plaintiff to go to the appellate court and ask for the injunction to go back into effect against the state. Uh, that's more than likely a 14th Amendment due process violation, but that's neither here nor now. If the Austin Court of Appeals enters the order 
reinstating that injunction as to the state, it's the, the, that puts the ball in the state's court. At that point, they would have to go to the Texas Supreme Court, and the, the rule is not applicable in that if they take a mandamus to the Texas Supreme Court, the injunction would stay in place during that time. Um, so one of the best ways that businesses can can stay updated, because I, I understand that it's, it's difficult to follow all of these orders going back and forth. It's like watching a ping pong match. Um, follow social media, uh, Ritter Spencer. We, we try to uh, have our, our uh, social media company post updates when we have them. We haven't posted anything about the notice of appeal because, again, it's ongoing, and they just filed it yesterday, and we spent most of the day uh, working on the brief. But anytime we have a major announcement about the case, we will um, post something either on the uh, we've got Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Chelsea, Twitter. Chelsea, we're going to take they've got it. Chelsea, we're going to take a quick break. On the other side, I'll have you come back and and we'll talk about this and, and wrap up before Lisa calls in on the bottom of the hour. It's the Texas Hemp Show. We'll be right back. Our guest Chelsea Spencer on the other side. Hey guys, be sure to go down and visit our friends Gene and Elsie down at the Green Mountain Flower Company, located up there in North Austin. I used to live right up there on Anderson Mill and 183. Green Mountain is right there next to Starbucks. They have all your CBD products that will keep you healthy and in good spirits. I know my wife takes the CBD oils for her lupus and it helps with the inflammation and pain. I know I've tried the pills and some of the teas that they have down there at Green Mountain. Stop by and tell them hello from your friends here at the Coach's Corner and the Horn. Green Mountain Flower, go by there and see Gene and Elsie. The Bloom Box from BC Northern Lights is the ultimate fully automated indoor growing system. Two chambers provide the user with a propagation area and 32 cubic feet of growing space designed to yield maximum results. Grow Smart technology makes the Bloom Box the most user friendly model on the market by controlling lighting, watering, CO2, and exhaust for you. The optional touchscreen sensor overload package makes the growing process even easier by controlling temperature, pH balance, moisture levels, and more. A wheeled base and lockable doors provide accessibility and security for your plants, while the Bloombox's power safe technology uses less energy than most common household appliances. Regardless of your experience, the Bloombox will help you take your growing to the next level. Start growing your own today with BC Northern Lights. Since 1938, TPS Lab has been guiding growers of many different crops around the world to making maximum yields and quality and solving difficult field problems with advanced innovative solutions. Hemp Plan offers the most advanced guidance to industrial hemp growers. The purpose of Hemp Plan is for you to realize the highest quality and yields with minimal THC for your crop's genetics by minimizing plant biotic and abiotic stresses. TPS Lab offers many services and options to the industrial hemp grower. Contact Joe at TPS Labs at 956-383-0739. That's 956-383-0739. That's TPS Lab. The Texas Hemp Reporter. News, trends, culture, health. Mail to over 1,000 licensed Texas hemp farmers and 100% free in over 500 locations in Austin, Texas. Subscribe today at TexasHempReporter.com. Now, back to the show with your host, publisher of the Texas Hemp Reporter, Russell Dowd. Welcome back to the Texas Hemp Show. I'm Russell Dowden, the publisher and editor for the Texas Hemp Reporter. Our guest this segment has been Chelsea Spencer. 
of Renner Spencer Law Firm, a full-service cannabis law firm, uh, protecting all of our rights with regards to the smokable hemp and the recent injunction. Welcome back to the show, uh, Chelsea. Thank you. Just wrapping up, before Lisa calls in, she's going to give us her thoughts on everything, and they've written an article for The Hemp Reporter that's coming out October 4th. And um, any final thoughts? Uh, what, what do people, what do we need to know in the, what's the next step for everyone with regards to this uh, as we move forward with the injunction? When would a trial even begin, uh, Chelsea? Uh, so right now our, our trial date is set for February 1st. Uh, that will depend on, obviously, how the appellate process plays out here. And, and that's one thing you can never anticipate because there are multiple instances during the underlying litigation at the trial court uh, that either party may be able to take an appeal of. So right now we, we are looking forward to an eye of uh, February 1st for the trial. But one thing that people can do in the interim, and, and this is incredibly important, this legislation was passed without the input of the hemp industry as to how the smokable ban impacts actual businesses here. And so it's very important that if you are in the Texas hemp industry considering becoming part of the part of the Texas hemp industry, um, Google and find out who your state representative and your state senator are and let them hear from you right now because unfortunately in the state of Texas, our Texas legislature only meets every two years. Uh, the next session begins in January, uh, and they will be busy from January to May. If this issue is not corrected, in addition to uh, a myriad of other things, frankly, that need to be fixed about our hemp program here, it will be another two years before we get a shot at fixing this again. So it's very important to let your elected officials know, particularly how these smokable bans are impacting you personally, if your shop has seen a substantial decline in revenue. Uh, if you had to destroy a product, uh, if you're having to close your business, uh, if you simply feel passionately about it one way or the other, please take the time to email, call them directly if they're willing to have a Zoom or sit down with you right now. That's very important to do because they, they cannot fix something that they, they are not aware of. Uh, and unfortunately, this provision in the bill was slipped in. It was not in the original bill. It came out of a conference committee change and the industry didn't get to put much input on it. So, so now is the pivotal time to be doing that. Well, well, it is. And um, we, we thank the work that you've been doing on, on all of this. Uh, do you have anything that you would like to contribute again to the magazine at some point at all, Chelsea? We, I know you did a big story on us up, leading up to all of this back in June, but uh, you've, done great, you've done great work here on this. And I uh, just wanted to extend that opportunity. And if there's anything we can do to, to get this um, word out more at the Texas Hemp Reporter, you know, feel free to, to, to have us as your playground. Sure, I would. I would love to contribute again. Um, time is, is of the essence right now. It's a little bit difficult for that. Sure. Um, but I will do my do my best to send you something. Now, uh, just real quick before the bottom of the hour break, I wanted to ask. Um, we had a client that had an in, in, in a incident that an advertiser got picked up with their licensed hemp load in, 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 a, in a northern Texas county, and I was just wondering, uh, do, do you? You represent companies that also deal with these challenges with transportation issues and permitting um, one of our yeah. advertisers. I, I wanted to, I didn't know if you were aware of the incident in Moore County. It was up in North Texas, but I, I wasn't sure if, uh, if you had heard about that. So unfortunately, yes, we do handle that. Um, two notes on that. Unfortunately, these things are happening every day. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a client with some of their good seeds in, in Dallas County, and we're working on getting those back. Um, always important to have the proper and valid documentation. We do handle that, but oftentimes, unless you are transporting substantial biomass or substantial product, the cost in filing a civil lawsuit to uh, either force return of those goods or to get damages if they were destructed can exceed the value of the goods. Yeah. Uh, so that's sort of a case-by-case -case call. But I am a big advocate, frankly, for uh, more increased law enforcement training because we've seen DPS has, uh, to my knowledge, received fairly substantial training 
But when it comes to the local police department, it's like a hodgepodge of, of who yeah. even knows there's a new law versus who doesn't. It's, it's frankly been been ridiculous in sporadic enforcement instances. Well, one of my organic growers that we profiled in last month's edition, Adrian um, Garcia Brothers Growers, with their organic operation in what, Northwest Texas, they went to their local law enforcement Jesse, just to say, hey, guys, we're growing hemp. We want to invite you out to our farm, let you see our operation, what we're growing. Here's our permits. Here's our manifest. Here's all of our legal documentation. And they, he said that that helped, but one of the county sheriffs was not very happy to go out there. And he was still a good old boy and didn't <laughs> want to come out there, you know, Chelsea. So uh, this does happen, but I think that Adrian uh, had a good point, and that's just, you know, educate your local law law enforcement yourself if you have to absolutely i will say that that often doesn't work because the the client whose goods were just seized last week uh for my client um the dallas police department has been to their facility three separate times uh, and they're very transparent and it uh it still happened and i think the problem is uh, perhaps certain portions of the department are receiving training or come out and then another portion doesn't but I have hopes that, uh, you know, as the program, every, look, every state that implements a hemp program has these uh, little hiccups and problems. And I have hopes that as law enforcement becomes familiar with this material, becomes familiar with the documentation that they're looking at, uh, we don't experience these issues anymore. But it, it frankly, it serves when law enforcement is looking at a valid COA, a valid producer licer, uh, license. Uh, and they still make the determination to seize because our statute permits them to, uh, absent probable cause to believe it's marijuana, the statute only provides them a basis to seize enough material to run a test on it to determine what it is. And, and unfortunately, that's not what's happening in practice. Well, um, I want to thank you for chiming in on this uh, hot topic. It's a very hot topic right now. It's, it's all real, very, very recent. Fire off your website and your contact information, Chelsea, just so people can get in touch with Ritter Spencer if they need any legal advice or just any want to know more about your, your defense. Uh, sure. So the website is www.ritter, R-I-T-T-E-R, Spencer, S-P-E-N-C-E-R dot com. Uh, we're on all of the social media. Um, should be just Ritter Spencer PLLC. Uh, and if you'd like to schedule uh, a consultation, I, I don't offer free consultations. Just full disclaimer there. You can contact info, I-N-F-O, at RitterSpencer.com, and our admin will get you set up. Awesome. Okay, well, there uh, we will have uh, an update from you as things develop in January. And thank you so much for clarification on this issue. Uh, Chelsea Spencer of Ritter Spencer, thank you so much for being a part of the Texas Hemp Show this afternoon. Thank you guys so much. It was a blast. Uh, thank you, Chelsea. There she goes. That's Chelsea Spencer. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we will have Lisa Pittman on from Coach Rose and more Texas Hemp Show after the break. BC Northern Lights is the ultimate fully automated indoor growing system. Two chambers provide the user with a propagation area and 32 cubic feet of growing space designed to yield maximum results. Grow Smart technology makes the Bloombox the most user friendly model on the market by controlling lighting, watering, CO2, and exhaust for you. The optional touchscreen sensor overload package makes the growing process even easier by controlling temperature, pH balance, moisture levels, and more. A wheeled base and lockable doors provide accessibility and security for your plants, while the Bloombox's power safe technology uses less energy than most common household appliances. Regardless of your experience, the Bloombox will help you take your growing to the next level. Start growing your own today with BC Northern Lights. 
folks, you know I've gone through a lot of pains over the last 20 years. My knees, my shoulder, and of course that back of mine. Now, I've tried everything. Massages, acupuncture, cryotherapy, and finally I found something that really works for me. GreenMountainFlower.com That's the cure. I've been looking all over the place for something that's going to help me feel good, help me sleep good. Green Mountain Flower has the most powerful CBD oil available. It's unique and it really works for me and tons of other people. Now, you'll see all kinds of CBD oils in shops all around the place. You know, the convenience stores and gas stations and places like that, but none like Green Mountain Flower. And Green Mountain Flower has the most nodule CBD oil retailers right here in Austin, Texas. It's natural, 100% absorption. It's water-based. And it absorbs into the body easier. It's unique and 100% organic formula. And it really has worked. Give a call today to 512-645-0510. Talk to Gene or Elsie and ask about the great products that they have. You'll find them on Facebook and online at GreenMountainFlower.com. The producer from BC Northern Lights is a fully automated indoor growing system that lives up to its name. Capable of housing 18 hydro plants, the producer is specially designed for large yields and maximum harvests. GrowSmart technology manages lighting, watering, CO2, and exhaust for you. The optional touchscreen sensor overload package makes the growing process even easier by controlling temperature, pH, moisture levels, and more. A wheeled base and lockable doors provides accessibility and security for your plants, while the producer's power-safe technology uses less energy than most common household appliances. Produce results. Reduce electricity. Incite envy with the producer. Start growing your own today with BC Northern Lights. The Texas Hemp Reporter. News, trends, culture, health. Mailed to over 1,000 licensed Texas hemp farmers. And 100% free in over 500 locations in Austin, Texas. Subscribe today at TexasHempReporter.com. Now, back to the show with your host, publisher of the Texas Hemp Reporter, Russell Dowd. Welcome back to the Texas Hip Show. Russell here with the Texas Hemp Reporter. And uh, this segment, our guest is Lisa Pittman, uh, co-chair of the Cannabis Business Law Group at the law firm Coates and Rose. Uh, Lisa Pittman Esquire wrote the uh, did the article with on the cover of last month's edition of the Texas Hemp Reporter uh, profiling none other than Texas Agriculture Commissioner uh, Sid Miller. Welcome to the program, Lisa. How are you this afternoon? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. On. Yes, I wasn't sure if you were able to hear some of Chelsea's conversation on the on that first segment, but. Um, uh, she's just reiterating us to pay, be aggressive and, and, and reaching out to, law, to our legislature regarding some of these issues and, and how important that is. But um, I got your article and laid some of that stuff out this afternoon today on the the article pro- coming up here in the upcoming edition of the Texas Hemp Reporter. Did the DEA's new rule confirm hemp-derived Delta-8 THC is illegal? And this this is the new story that we received today from from uh, Lisa and Andrea. Um, and so we were playing uh, with the layout and the graphics on that one today. What, let, let you chime in on this Delta 8 T- THC. Is this illegal now, Lisa? Well, we don't think so. But, of course, the typical lawyer answer is it depends. <laughs> so if it is derived from hemp, as that's de- defined in the Farm Bill, um, and the end product is hemp, meaning it is under 0.3% Delta 9 THC, then it should still be legal. So I do understand that there are some synthetic processes that are involved in creating the final product, but it is not a synthetic cannabinoid in of itself because Delta 8 is present in the plant in trace amounts in natural forms. In contrast to synthetic cannabinoids such as K2 and spice and such, 
And so we believe that those are the types of synthetic cannabinoids that the DEA was referring to in its interim final, in its rule that it uh, recently published in conforming its regulations to acknowledge the farm bill. Yeah, is the hemp derived Delta ATHC synthetically derived? Well, that that's the that's the question, <laughs> and we've talked to a lot of uh, chemists and laboratories, and um, yeah, I mean there is a a bit of a synthetic process that's involved, but it doesn't render the cannabinoid a synthetic cannabinoid. I mean, if you were to argue that that synthetic process. Um, makes it a synthetic cannabinoid, well, then CBD, CBG, I mean, all of these isolates and distillates would then be synthetic. So we don't think that it's synthetic in the legal term uh, as that is intended, as it's referred to in uh, as, as a K1, Spice, or even Marinol or Jovenol, those, those types of synthetically made cannabinoids. From my understanding, Lisa, there's an actual like congressional legal definition of a synthetic and research chemicals like you brought up that are labeled K2, spice, whatnot, they fall under that specific legal definition. And it's something along the lines of pretty much like a chemist in a lab has thrown a bunch of chemicals together and has made this false cannabinoid, whereas Delta-8 is not that. Right. Now, should be made aware that Delta-8 THC derived from marijuana is a listed controlled substance, but if it is derived from the hemp plant, it should be okay. How could anybody know the difference? <laughs> <laughs> is it exactly. hemp? Is it hemp or is it marijuana? We're back at that again. <laughs> and that's where we're all. That's where it all starts. That's where we're we're here. <laughs> this is why we're doing this. Where what was first, the chicken or the egg? I know it's. All- that's right. <laughs> and so, something I've wondered as well that what you brought up is that, from my understanding, they wrote the farm bill and THCA, the acid, they considered that as something that counts towards the 0.3% limit. Is the, How does that language that includes that not include Delta-8? Well, the drop quote right here in her article has the DEA's regulatory authority over any plant with less than 3% THC content on a dry weight basis and any of the plant's derivatives under the 3% THC content limit is removed as a result. That I have a that's a quote from your story, Lisa. Right. All all derivatives, anything coming out of the hemp plant as defined there should should be okay. Mhm. So this Delta-8, it's present in uh, trace amounts naturally in the hemp plant. So anything that you make or derive from it should also then be legal hemp. I kept hearing over and over and over at the the normal meetings, the Texas normal meetings in Austin, before we went on lockdown for COVID, Mm -hmm. but they kept saying, if you have the THCA, (laughs) the acid, because when it gets heated up to a certain temperature, it gets converted into Delta-9, that the FDA themselves saying that's not the DEA, that was the FDA. And Congress was saying, hey, this is part of this rule that gets counted. That's a form of THC. We're putting all of this together. So I'm wondering how this derivative doesn't fit under that language that they used. Uh, I don't think I'm following the question there. Oh. Um, so there's another component, uh, THCA, correct? That we find right. in hemp. And Congress had actually <laughs> outlined that that would be considered part of the the limit, the 0.3% limit, or am I misinformed about that? Right, uh, like the, under the total THC standard? Correct. I guess right. the question is... And that, is that's the, uh-huh. Go ahead. Uh, how are they calculating that? Like, how does Delta-8 not fit into that calculation? Well, I don't think they were even thinking about Delta-8 when right. they were in the farm bill or even when they put out this recent rule. I, I just don't really think it was on their radar. Yeah, and that's one of the things towards the end of the article is uh, uh, that I was reading this morning is, you know, while Congress may not have intended to unleash hemp-derived Delta-8 THC specifically, it certainly intended to create an open market for hemp and all that is hemp and all that comes from it, except for specifically Delta-9 THC. I said, I'm worried that they're going to pull the number that like we're seeing with DSHS. We're like, well, it was implied with this. We, 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 we made this language, and despite we didn't think about it, it was implied. Well, I mean, they, they would have to specifically 
state that. And so what, what they just released with that DEA rule, it was, it was not specific. It was general in its reference to synthetics. And I don't really believe that it changed anything. I don't think anything was different yesterday than today. It was merely acknowledging that the farm bill happened and that hemp was now accepted from the definition of marijuana and all the derivatives from hemp as well. Awesome. Um, I spoke with uh, Miss Andrea a couple weeks back, and we were talking about another issue that I guess has come up with this ruling the DEA has put out is that there's a, there's a moment where you're processing hemp, where you're going from the dry weight to like a CBD oil. And during that process, it's very much capable you go above the 0.3% limit. And I'm wondering how much do processors need to really worry about that, that the DEA could come and do something? Well, it's definitely a point of concern and exposure, but keep in mind that the USDA gave the hemp program to the state to regulate for themselves within their borders. And it wasn't intended for DEA to be policing this at all. So I wouldn't expect DEA to come knock down the doors of hemp processors. And I don't even think that they would want to. I mean, I've been working in this area for at least five years. And remember, up until a year and a half ago, hemp, even in the pilot states, was considered marijuana by the federal government. And even in the pilot states, hemp was not supposed to cross state lines, but it did. We never saw any DEA enforcement on that because it's such a low priority for the DEA. Their main concern right now is meth, fentanyl, opioids, drug cartels, thing coming across the border. All the heavy stuff. Kicking down the doors and processor for two hundredths of a percentage of something that's temporarily <laughs> hot. That's not of their concern. This you yeah. know, this is these are state programs, so keep that in mind. That's a good they got bigger fish to fry than than just the three percent, the three and a half percent, three percent of some of our growers throughout the the United States. Lisa, can you speak on how important it is? I understand that despite the, you know, the effectiveness of the injunction rule, they are taking uh, accepting comments on the ruling right until October 20th or so. Is that right? Uh, On the rule? Yes. I mean, you can, you can, yeah. Can you still write or, or comment on it, your article stated that the the comments were being accepted through October 20th. Yes, yes, you should definitely submit comments on this. Um, you know, even though I don't believe that the DEA intends to pursue, um, you know, hint processors here, it's, it's still, you know, nobody wants their business to be exposed. And it is an area of concern if you are shipping product from one location to another that's hot, you know, that person, I don't think the DEA is going to come after them, but the, you know, the local cop that pulls somebody over because they have a broken taillight, okay, well, now they've got what the cop considers hash in their car, you know, and so that person's going to be locked up, and then the the company is going to have to go through all the legal hassle of dealing with that, so it's absolutely something that should be commented on, and again, this may not have been something that they uh, intended or really thought about, they were just restating the definition of hemp under the farm bill. And that's it, is really what I think. I want to make sure I can confirm something because I'm seeing a lot of misinformation about this comment period as well, that the rule has actually gone into effect. They just happen to have the comment period going alongside them implementing the comments. Because typically in the past we've seen they implement comments, they take some feedback, then they put, then they put the rule in place. This time they put the rule in place and said, well, you've got until October 20th to comment. Yeah, it's because they're saying this rule didn't change anything. This rule is just acknowledging the farm bill and the the new definition of, of hemp and accepting that from the definition of marijuana. So I, that's why there wasn't a notice and comment period because the DEA is saying nothing's changed. We're, we are just conforming the rules. Thank you for that. Well, I, I appreciate the, the the clarity. We're just trying to get some information out there with the Texas Hemp Show. And that's all the time I've got, Lisa. We look forward to your new article. How can folks get a hold of you if they need to get in touch with uh, Coach Rose or, or get in touch with Lisa Pittman? Oh, you can just email me, lpittman at coachrose.com. All right, Lisa Pittman, a contributing 
to Texas Hemp Reporter once again. She does great work over there with Coats Roads. Thank you, Lisa, for being a part of the Texas Hemp Show this week. Thanks so much. Keep it up. Uh, all right. Thank you. There she goes. That's Lisa Pittman from Coates Rose Law Firm. She is the co-chair of the Cannabis Business Law Group there at Coates Rose. We'll be right back on the other side. It's the Texas Hemp Show. We'll be right back after this. Hey guys, be sure to go down and visit our friends Gene and Elsie down at the Green Mountain Flower Company, located up there in North Austin. I used to live right up there on Anderson Mill and 183. Green Mountain is right there next to Starbucks. They have all your CBD products that will keep you healthy and in good spirits. I know my wife takes the CBD oils for her lupus and it helps with the inflammation and pain. I know I've tried the pills and some of the teas that they have down there at Green Mountain. Stop by and tell them hello from your friends here at the Coach's Corner in the Horn. Green Mountain Flower. Go by there and see Gene and Elsie. The Bloom Box from BC Northern Lights is the ultimate fully automated indoor growing system. Two chambers provide the user with a propagation area and 32 cubic feet of growing space designed to yield maximum results. Grow Smart technology makes the Bloom Box the most user friendly model on the market by controlling lighting, watering, CO2, and exhaust for you. The optional touchscreen sensor overload package makes the growing process even easier by controlling temperature, pH balance, moisture levels, and more. A wheeled base and lockable doors provide accessibility and security for your plants, while the Bloombox's power safe technology uses less energy than most common household appliances. Regardless of your experience, the Bloombox will help you take your growing to the next level. Start growing your own today with BC Northern Lights. Since 1938, TPS Lab has been guiding growers of many different crops around the world to making maximum yields and quality and solving difficult field problems with advanced innovative solutions. Hemp Plan offers the most advanced guidance to industrial hemp growers. The purpose of Hemp Plan is for you to realize the highest quality and yields with minimal THC for your crop's genetics by minimizing plant biotic and abiotic stresses. TPS Lab offers many services and options to the industrial hemp grower. Contact Joe at TPS Labs at 956-383-0739. That's 956-383-0739. That's TPS Lab. The Texas Hemp Reporter. News, trends, culture, health. Mailed to over 1,000 licensed Texas hemp farmers and 100% free in over 500 locations in Austin, Texas. Subscribe today at TexasHempReporter.com. Now, back to the show with your host, publisher of the Texas Hemp Reporter, Russell Dowden. Man. Oh, Mr. Policeman, please stay, stay home. home. Please stay home, Mr. Policeman. Welcome back to the Texas Hemp Show. <laughs> stay home, Mr. Policeman. Don't come knocking on my door, please. All right, I'm Russell Dowden, editor of the Texas Hemp Reporter. Great stuff uh, in this week's show regarding the injunction. Jesse, we wanted to have the attorneys on that are kind of representing, really spearheading most of that is Chelsea. That's her official client. But you know what they did? She, Chelsea asked me about two weeks ago. She said, Russell, can you send me a PDF of your last issue from the Texas Hemp Reporter with Sid Miller on the cover? And I said, sure, uh, you, you want me to, uh, didn't I mail you one? She said, no, 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 I need a digitally, uh, a PDF version. And uh, I finally got it to her. But the reason she wanted it, I didn't come to find out, was that she was submitting it as, uh, 
evidence or an article or what? what what's, oh, discovery. They were yeah, doing she, dis- they were doing discovery. She in announced the court it case. as the, so. So this issue in its digital form was um, uh, submitted as discovery. Honorable. And, yeah, it was. Uh, and then that cool. That's cool. I, I, wish, I wish they would be contacting me. Hey, man, you wrote this great article. <laughs> you got all these retailers talking about how it's hurting them. We're going to use this in court. Well, I mean, it had Sid Miller in, on the cover with the uh, you know, Agriculture Commissioner, uh, all of the articles. Uh, the entire publication itself is a discovery. She submitted as – Well, everybody's getting this. Yes. Like you mentioned, if you if – It's going to the farmers. If you're a producer, retailer, all this stuff, if they've registered, they're getting this. <laughs> and it's like, well, these people are aware of this. This is a statewide circulation. But so, I failed to mention that to Chelsea that about the dis- that her submitting the Texas Hemp Reporter um, and her discovery uh, for the the, the hearing uh, to what last week wasn't it? Yes, it was the one that was Tuesday, the fourteenth, the fourteenth. Yeah, <laughs> so I believe that was Monday. That was it, Monday of it, last. Yes, it didn't do a whole lot of Monday good. Monday or Tuesday. It, it didn't do a whole lot. Was, of it, good, the though. hearing was Monday. We held the podcast recording on Tuesday. We were still waiting to hear about the injunction on, on the, Thursday, on like, which didn't come till Thursday. Yeah, it didn't come till Thursday. They handed down this this letter ruling, as mentioned earlier, and it was just it was this little short, com- complex thing that really didn't give enough direction for everybody to know what they needed to do. And they had to go back to the judge. It was like you're asking us to put our own orders in. We know kind of like the state's going to go, no. <laughs> well, before that discussion with you last week and, and you know, we weren't intending on releasing the podcast until October. but It's so timely. It, it made sense to release the, them. And so we're just releasing them. Here we are. We're just le- taking the, like this is ti- recording and Tuesdays. It, and it's timely again because we just had a discussion about how this in- temporary injunction went into place. But because the state has put an appeal up. The injunction now like doesn't hold. Yeah, so, so we got to wait. So we got to wait for the appellate court <laughs> now again to get the injunction back. Back. So re- it's like we need retailers to know, hey, um, despite you know the likelihood of somebody coming by and saying, hey, you can't have that on the shelf, trying to put cuffs on you. Put, is, put tea. <laughs> put tea on all of your. <laughs> but you're not selling. Pre- it's like you just don't sell pre rolls right now. Things of that nature. Yeah. If, if you if you want to take the risk, you take the risk, and that is on you. Not on us. One of my advertisers just said that they were going to sell tea. Have have their oh the flower itself. They the just flower put tea was on it. tea. Yeah, it's my tea jars. It's, it's buy pot- your tea. It's potpourri. Po- it's potpourri. I want my car to smell like weed. You know, it's just an everyday average <laughs> they eat thing. Flower <laughs> weed. Flower. So very interesting stuff there. Next week we're going to have on our friends from TPS Lab choosing a quality lab, and they've got a big event they're doing with Acres Magazine. And I'm supposed to be talking to Ryan. Uh, may, we may get Ryan, the publisher of Acres Magazine, on the podcast next week as well. But TPS Labs, we were doing some testing with them earlier, uh, Jesse. That was those guys that was testing some gear out. But they're going to be on the show next week talking about their big webinar on October 5th. And that's part of what uh, a big webinar that Acres is running on as a kind of an online webinar conference. COVID has killed all of the conferences this year. Oh yeah, everybody's trying to go digital, and it just it just doesn't work. I, I've watched, it's, I've tried watching something, just trials, trying to watch somebody go to trial. Even this hemp case, I got to watch the, the footage of it when it was live happening, mm-hmm. and I'm like, wow, this is just I couldn't do this, and I can't imagine having to go to court on a Zoom hearing, and you're trying to have a jury where you got a guy who's like, you know, I'm just going to get some scotch and a cigarette and sit here and listen to this case. <laughs> Well, I just wear a bathrobe, and it's like, really? That's the guy who's going to decide my outcome. Thanks. Yeah, the, 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 it's been a, a weird year with all of the events. Uh, there's been things where they've had. What's the big one in Seattle? Don't they do that every fall? The the there's a hemp convention up there. They NOLA got canceled. That was turned into webinar. The New Orleans, the big one that is done by um, MJ Business. Uh, was it, was it MJ M- Biz? Yeah, MJ Biz how hosts a, uh, was supposed to host a big one, I think, that was going to be in June or July in New Orleans. I think there was supposed to be one called like Imperious Expo in Dallas. Did they, that was supposed to happen this month. And from, and from what I understand, it had to be canceled or went virtual. And, and, and it's then, like Comic-Con, Comic-Con <laughs> had to go virtual. And they're like, why didn't this work? And it's like, well, it's, it's the type virtual. of... <laughs> it's virtual. <laughs> it's the type of event that usually everybody hears about it just by word of mouth, knowing the date. So they get tickets, but it was one of those things that they went virtual and thought the same thing would happen, and it just it, it fell apart. 
Well, we have some articles that we're going to be coming out. The next issue of the Texas Hemp Reporter will come out October 5th-ish to the 7th. I, I send it to the printer around the 4th of October. And, Jesse, this one... We want to get it out to some of the other states. We've been picking up and acquiring uh, states around Texas, and so we're going to try to make the upcoming issue available in Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, New Mexico, and we're going to get the local states that are near Texas. We'll we'll, we'll get the Texas Hemp Reporter uh, regionally uh, for a little bit. So that's something new that we're gonna we're gonna do. There are we're already mailing these to about thirteen hundred folks in uh, Texas, but we're going to be adding those other states too. So I think that nice. that's going to be a, a cool thing. Um, got articles on CBG, the new cannabinoid, uh, coming out. Just kind of ro- talking about some of the articles that we've got. Um, there's one building with hemcrete. There was a lady, Gail Moran, was from the Houston area and born and raised in Trinidad. Gail's in the construction industry, and in two thousand eight, she was constructing a chapel entirely made of hempcrete and way ahead of the curve in 08. So if you look right here, there's these are images of her building that little chapel in uh, some little East Texas town. I don't I can't see what it's where it was. It's like this Alamo facade to it. Yeah, it's really cool looking though this this little chapel and this was done with hempcrete. So we thought we would cover that. And that was one of the stories there. Also, the history of Texas hemp is one that that is also being uh, discussed with the story of George Trout, pioneer of the the crop. He lost his crops, and that was back in the 40s. So uh, Stacey Lovett did an interesting piece on that as well. Yeah, history of Texas hemp. So covering some of that in in the next edition of the Texas Hemp Reporter. So uh, sharing stuff with that. There's also an interview with our friends that were on last week from New Bloom Labs. They do rapid atom laboratory analysis for growers and processors throughout the Southwest. So good stuff coming from the Texas Hemp Reporter next, uh, next month, and that'll be out. Also looked at maybe booking, we're booking more guests on the program for the coming weeks, and we'll have a big full-page ad in the magazine that's coming up in uh, October profiling our guests that are going to be in there. So looking at uh, Vera Leaf, uh, Justin Fisher, CEO of Vera Leaf, joining us alongside Lee Vernon, uh, the CEO of First Responder Fuel in October on the 6th, the 13th. Uh, Coleman Hemphill of the Texas Hemp Industry Association will be joining us on October uh, 13th. Also, maybe uh, my, our friend Romeo Sesto of Hempsey will probably chime in on that show as well. I asked Coleman to call in on this show tonight, but I, I didn't. I don't know if he's... He, he's, yeah, I saw the email for that. was like, okay, we're he, I included him on that email. I was like, so. Lee Chesley Spencer, Lisa Pittman, and Coleman Hemp. I was like, I, I, but I you know, know all three of these but names. To, but to Coleman's credit, I, he called me last week to confirm all of this, and I was on the other line, and I never called him back. So he probably needed me to call him to confirm on that. But, Coleman, if you're hearing this, I, I do have you scheduled for an appearance either here in studio or over the phone on October 13th. So if you didn't make this show this week, we'll, we've got you down on uh, for two more weeks. So, um, But good stuff. Uh, how are you How are you feeling about this show so far? I'm anxious in a good way. Kind of like when you get the butterflies in your stomach, you're like, yeah, like, n- new movie's coming out. You've been waiting for years for this movie <laughs> to come out. Bill, Bill and Ted face the music. It's like waiting for that. <laughs> and it happens, and you're like, oh, yes. <laughs> Well, again, all shows here are recorded at our friends at Takeoff Terminal Studios. Every Tuesday at 5 p.m. we record, and then we release them basically the next day out there for TexasHempReporter.com and and on our social medias, and and folks can download and and share those. So, yeah, um, and we're going to look for – I've got us on Transistor.fm is the platform for the podcast, and so there's – and I may need your help on this, Jesse, uh, but we can get this where we're – you know, on Stitcher, Spotify, we can get it where it's on Apple Podcasts, Google Play. I've just got to enter and create the link for those podcasts on those platforms. So I haven't got to all of that yet. This is only week two. But do uh, you know a little bit about getting uh, that? A little bit. Uh, and maybe, maybe I know more on that. I don't know. I know that I've played with it, but getting the, the podcast on more platforms as we build the show. You can always come to the social media social media places and find the link posted up if you're yeah. ever looking for that. So Yeah, we're, we're always on Facebook, uh, Twitter, 
and Instagram. If they let us only on Instagram, I don't think they let you post your po- podcast links. Yeah, as far as I know, that's. Uh, you can like, find- is, do you have a picture? <laughs> you have a picture? Do you have a picture? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we will keep these on YouTube eventually and our YouTube channel. Facebook, though, uh, TexasHempReporter.com. You can find our podcast there every week. And then uh, once we get a couple of them loaded up, we'll be on the TexasHempShow.com once I got about a handful of those done. So uh, any final thoughts, Jesse? Um, I was actually flipping through your most recent issue, and I like that there's an article yet again about hemp banking. Hemp banking is like... I, my shtick right now that I'm on, I'm like, people need hemp banking. Hemp banking is important. People need to know about these rules. Vera Leaf, uh, very heavily involved in hemp banking and uh, their software side of stuff. They'll, uh, again, Justin F- Fisher, CEO of Vera Leaf, joining us October 6th. So, good stuff. We'll see you guys next week on the Texas Hemp Show. Uh, Jesse, thanks for doing this with me again, man. Oh, no problem. I'm, I'm glad to come up and do this. I'm down here and record. <laughs> Well, it's good stuff. It's the Texas Hemp Reporter and the Texas Hemp Show. We'll see you next week. Special thanks to Jake and the crew here at Takeoff Terminal Studios. Be sure to check them out online at takeoffterminal.studio. And there you have it. The Texas Hemp Show will be back next Tuesday with our friends from TPS Labs. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.